Good afternoon, my name is Edwin Moore. This is Eric Gutierrez and Michelle Gunnison. And as you were just told, our project is Earthboxes Wind Turbines for the collection of highway wind energy. The brief overview of our project was that we had to take three design considerations um, into effect for designing this wind turbine and then test these design considerations using uh, university resources and then we also tested to see if there was a way to implement these um, considerations. The considerations we used, we decided, were the bearings, the linkage arms, and the airfoils. We used um, results to create a theoretical uh, wind turbine production, and then we also investigated the feasibility of the highway installation. To go over what a vertical axis wind turbine is, it is decided on the orientation of the rotor to the ground. So since it's perpendicular, it's considered a vertical uh, axis wind turbine. They work omnidirectionally, so no matter which way the wind source is coming from, they'll still rotate. They also work in low wind speeds, which is perfect for where we decided to try to use them. They also have a simple mechanical design, so the cost of these isn't as great as the larger scale ones. The motivation for this was the environmental need for a more reliable green energy and the economic potential for a uh, free energy source. So if there's wind on a highway, we know this. Uh, highways are also clear areas of land that don't have as many obstructions, so wind can freely flow through them, creating the ideal environment for wind turbines, as well as most highways are in rural locations, so trying to get energy to those locations is a lot more costly than if we were to find a way to produce energy for those locations on site. Um, the potential for a renewable energy um, integrated into urban space as well. The goals of this project, Michelle will talk more about. Okay, so originally when we started, we were very optimistic with this project. We wanted to construct a full-size turbine and install it along the highway. We were lucky enough to have uh, very intelligent advisors to ensure us that that was not the best course of action and would do little to contribute to renewable energy in general. So we focused on three design considerations. The first being the airfoils, we uh, tested and analyzed three airfoils. Linkage arms, testing two different support structures that differed in the length of each arm to test the effect of the moment arm on the efficiency of the turbine. And then we performed a bearing analysis on a theoretical turbine that would be installed on Global design, there is a lot of opportunity for global design here because renewable energy is necessary for the future of our planet. We want to contribute to the research and development that's being conducted worldwide by many different engineers and scientists to improve the performance of this renewable energy source. And also, it, we learned in our research that we must uh, work together internationally to collaborate to improve renewable energy, especially when literature research, there's a lot of information out there. We learned there's a lot of potential for improvement, especially in wind energy. A recent improvement that has been made is by Dr. John DeBerry, Professor of Aeronautical and Bioengineering at um, Caltech. He has uh, kind of pioneered the process of schooling turbines, where they work off of the drafts of other turbines, the clients of other turbines, to improve their efficiency up to 10%, uh, 10 times, I'm sorry, 10 times the efficiency of other turbines that were not schooled. So this shows that there is a lot of potential for improvement in this field and that more time and energy needs to be focused to find that improvement. Um, MIT has also initialized a lot of programs focusing on the installation of these turbines in highway areas. Uh, factors contributing to efficiency, there are many factors, that's why we narrowed it down to three components of the turbine. Survey of related standards, uh, a big concern is safety. Because these turbines will theoretically be installed along the highway and they will be moving, commuter and bird environmental safety is considered. The size, generally one thinks that the bigger the turbine, the more efficient it is, but roadside, they, can, they must be smaller and we needed to find a way to make sure that the smaller size would not impact the efficiency negatively. The feasibility is also the willingness of federal entities to allow for this kind of installation. We did uh, attempt to contact the FTOT and we got a brief taste of how the bureaucracy of the government and FTOT can be. Um, the airfoils, they were chosen from the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NACA, the predecessor to NASA. From the database, we did the four digit series. The four digit series, the first digit indicates the maximum camber and the percentage of the quarter of the airfoil, the second digit, the highest camber from the leading edge, and the last two digits are the maximum thickness of the airfoil in terms of the percentage of the quarter. We have an illustration to show you numbers. 
Okay, here is this airfoil has camber. If you go to the next slide, you can see that the three airfoils we chose are symmetrical airfoils, meaning that the first two digits are a zero. We chose 009, 0018, 0024. We selected these airfoils because 0018 is the most commonly implemented airfoil for vertical axis wind turbines. We wanted to see what the difference would be in the performance of the turbine airfoils for a smaller, thinner, and a thicker airfoil. So we chose one above and one below the 0018 to see considerable differences. For our analysis, uh, we uh, investigated the lift to drag ratio, which was made available. These are the lift to drag ratios for three airfoils at 50,000, 100,000, and 500,000 Reynolds number. Uh, in aerospace, obviously a higher lift to drag ratio is more desirable, and we wanted to see how these numbers would reflect in our physical experimental testing. Uh, linkage arms testing, the identical designs, five arm designs, the only difference was the length of each individual arm, and this was to directly isolate and test the difference that the moment arm would make on the performance of the turbine. And now Eric's going to explain the bearing analysis that was performed. Okay. So the important issue dealing with bearings and the vertical axis wind turbine is friction. Um, obviously that is the big factor that either enhances or makes your turbine really bad. The friction being produced by a bearing was analyzed using the equation below, where MR is the friction torque, uh, F is the radial axial load, FF is a coefficient of friction of a rolling bearing. Those are specific to certain types of bearings and the specific one. DM is the mean diameter, which is a correlation between the inner and the outer diameter of the actual bearing. <clears throat> Choosing the right bearing. After various calculations, those finally narrowed down to bell bearings due to both friction resistance and availability of the ball bearings. The two bearings analyzed were variations of ball bearings. One was a double shielded and one was a <clears throat> double sealed ball bearing, parts number such and such, respectively. Why the double shielded ball bearing was chosen. Here are an example of specs for both of them. Um, both of them are a sealed design, which is good, but the double shielded was has vents to allow dispersion of heat, which the double sealed does not. Therefore, it, the buildup of heat builds up more resistance in the actual bearing. Also, the double shielded has lower frictional torque at 48.9 newton meter meters, and opposing the double sealed, which is 51.8. Also, the double shielded is less expensive and more expensive, the audience. And now, Eddie will, with the uh, wind speed experiments. So we were able to obtain an anemometer, and Eric and I went out to the highway and tested what it would be like in the field. Our basis of comparison was that we went to the top of the sixth floor parking garage at main campus to see just what the wind conditions were there on any given day. And then immediately afterwards, we went over to Ronald Reagan Highway and took wind speed data collection for a minute at each location, starting with the left shoulder and then into the median, the right shoulder and then the off ramp just to see what kind of uh, flow we were getting. The overall average was 5.7 miles per hour when you accounted for every situation we were in. The highest wind flow we got was at the top of PG6 with 18.9 miles per hour. And then the second highest was at the off ramp. So here is a video that we took of us actually proving that when a car goes by, the wind goes up. Where that truck went past, I don't know if you can see, but it went up six miles per hour just from that truck going past. Then a group of traffic comes past and once again increases it at um, several miles per hour. So that even on a slow day where the wind speed is only two miles per hour, once traffic goes by, it goes up considerably. After that, we decided to come inside and start testing in a safer environment. Uh, we constructed three or two different uh, size arms with the three different size airfoil blades. You can see the blades there. There's the longer set of arms. We did it all in the MakerBot that our advisor was kind enough to provide, and then we did the wind tunnel testing. Um, you can see the apparatus right inside there. Good. Next slide. We got a picture of me putting it all together and the. Uh, it's spinning in there, there's a video of, of the winning combination right there going on. So our, our winning combination ended up being the longer arms with the NACA airfoil 0018. It had the highest RPMs. Um, 
there was a close second though with the shorter arms and the thicker, the 0024. Um, we did the wind speed testing at five meters per second and that was based off of when we initially tried to do this, we didn't have a bearing inside the system just to show that without a bearing you get practically nothing. I mean really did, there was no airflow. So when we went to go do testing with the bearing, it um, sped it up considerably until I actually rotated. The standards used, there were equations to find the power of the wind using air density, the velocity cube, and the swept area of the turbine between the diameter of the arms and the length of the blades. Um, there's a bet limit that says that you cannot get more than 60% uh, from uh, wind energy for a turbine. And then from there, we actually used a coefficient of performance of 15% because they said for a vertical turbine, we found online that um, for a simply constructed one, you would get a coefficient of performance around 15%. For a well-made one, you get 35%. So we used a 15% uh, coefficient of power to uh, theoretically determine that our mini turbine can produce 568 milliwatts. Then we experimentally tested it while it was in the turbine, and we got a 62.2 milliwatts. So it was about 11% efficiency between it, and from the design, you can kind of see why that happened. We determined that our large-scale turbine, if we were to factor in everything, would be able to produce 36.2 watts of electricity, but probably at a 30% efficiency, so we get about 10.8 watts. Um, it would cost us about 15,000 to manufacture. Uh, we went online and just picked out the lowest price things that we could get, and this was the best we could come up with. If we were to do this wholesale, hopefully the prices would be a lot better. And Eric and I talked about the environmental concerns. So basically for our vertical axis wind turbine, we wanted to both make it safe for commuters and birds. So we kind of incorporated in our design something that will meet the criteria for both. The installations also should not damage the <coughs> ecosystem. We try to not interfere with anything. So we're putting them on the actual poles that are already there for future reference. And we're obviously trying to eliminate the portion of coal being used in the world. We, we're trying to implement more green energy instead of, you know, backtracking from the original coal. For our conclusion, we concluded that NACA 0018 had the highest RPMs with the larger diameter arms, which is that one right there. Um, we also concluded that the double shielded ball bearings were the best. The average wind speed during the testing was 5.7 miles per hour, and we hope that this research will be of use contributing to further development of other renewable energy. Future plans. We plan on manufacturing this full-scale model to test. Adapted. We want to globally adapt this to houses, fence lines, or other structures. I mean, why stop at highways? Experimenting with fish schooling, like John DeBerry stated, we want to implement a lot of these so they can all work together. And obviously, government approval for implementation. This is our vertical axis wind turbine in the engineering showcase. You can see how everybody's gathering around. They're interested. And here we went to an elementary school in an outreach program. And we're trying to get kids, even kids, involved in this green energy movement. This is our GAN chart and our team poster. We are open to any questions. Thank you. about thrust bearings since you've got a load vertically and horizontal because if your blades were absolutely perfect they wouldn't except for the weight it wouldn't be a thrust load but they're never going to be perfect so they're either going to want to go up or they're going to want to go down and ball bearings typically you can get them with a thrust side to them so they'll absorb that but you also have like tapered roller bearings that could be used right we basically looked into pretty much all of them and we kind of came down to what was more accessible and fit our budget really. <laughs> we didn't want to go super high. But those are considerations. We right. Yeah. Do, do Did you ever look at return on investment? How long would it take to pay, pay back on us? So um, the way we were trying to calculate for uh, kilowatt hours, it was incorrect. We would need to actually have a model that we could use to power a battery to figure out how much electricity we could generate over a certain amount of time and then use that to um, 
evaluated over a longer period of time with the cost. I had a figure came, that I came up with, but after reviewing it a couple of times and going over it with some people who have more experience with electrical energy than me, that we found it to be somewhat inaccurate. So putting it in our presentation, I didn't feel Bracket. comfortable doing it. Was it okay. how many years? Oh, uh, we uh, would expect at least a five-year life off of all of the materials and the bearings and everything used before we should really see any issues with maintenance. And, and how long would you have to run the system ballpark to uh, break even on the cost? Um, again, that comes down to figuring out just how much electricity it would be able to generate over a certain amount of time and not being able to come up with a precise thing. After I did a little bit of calculations, I had uh, about $60 per kilowatt hour over the five year time span. But then trying to evaluate that, it just wasn't feasible as far as how much um, it really could produce or not produce. Can I jump in really quick? I disagree that it's not feasible. Okay, from day one, all three of you, I said to you, you have to have that metric in your final, final evaluation, right? In fact, you guys all know that. So just to let you know, it's extremely disappointing to not see cost per kilowatt hour anywhere in this presentation. Okay, okay. I just want to let you know that. I apologize. I, I took it out from the previous conversation we had about not having the you guys started for it. Eight months ago, I, and day one, the first things first was what's the cost per kilowatt hour? Right? No one was saying you need to beat anything, but you didn't even frame this in terms of any other energy source. Right? You didn't frame it, and I talked to you guys a lot about that. What the cost per kilowatt hour is, is the most important factor, and that not being in here is very frustrating. Very, very frustrating. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's the hard part, right? I think you guys did some nice work to try to figure out what's the most efficient. Just then tell me that in terms of cost, right? Yeah. Okay.